my greetings to uh, uh, the residents at Arlington Place in Grundy Center, Iowa, because they, they are using our sermons on Sunday morning as their devotional there in the our senior center. And uh, so uh, all the residents there that are going to be hearing this service, we send our greetings to Grundy Center, Iowa. And that is in the center of the state of Iowa. And uh, we appreciate it. Than being used. And the reason for that is my sister happens to be the activities director there. <laughs> there is. It's not that I'm so popular, it's just it's just that she she doesn't want to do a devotional. That's what I mean. Okay? So she just pipes in on ours. Now you know the whole story. Jonah, chapter one. We're gonna be going through Jonah the next few weeks. Jonah, chapter one. And you know this wonderful story of this character of Jonah. And uh, we're going to be looking at him in the weeks to come. Jonah chapter 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent this great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break apart. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God, and maybe he will make to take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do, and where do you come from, and what is your country, and from what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them that. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. And I know that, is, that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah, and they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And thus the story of our servant, Jonah. Following the Lord. After we had some wonderful lessons in Sunday school the last few weeks, and last week we talked about the Lord isn't here to make you happy. Happiness is not necessarily God. Now, he's not here to make you sad either. He's, he's here to bring joy into your life, which is different from happiness. And how do we find this happiness? Well, in life, we learn that for a lot of people, money, they're convinced makes them happy. 
popularity, power, even things like education. All those things we're told will bring happiness into our life. So what happens then is we learn a whole list of people that pursued all those things, had all the money they could ever want in life, had everything that you think, humanly speaking, would bring them happiness, and they were not happy. In fact, some of them even ended their own life. Jonah's pursuing God, and he wants to get this right. He wants to do what is right in his pursuit of God. And God tells him, he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, you have to understand, if, 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 you're, if, if you're looking at this passage of Scripture, that the most hated people of Jonah's culture were the Ninevites. The Assyrians were terrible, ruthless people who ruled over these people and, and, and abused them terribly. And they were just waiting for God's judgment on these people because they believed God's judgment would come to them because God would never rescue such a brutal group of people as the Ninevites. And God said, Jonah, I want you to go to them and preach forgiveness that is not the message Jonah wanted to give him. He would have loved to go to Nineveh, and he would have loved to cry out to them, you're done. It's over. God's judgment upon you. In three days, God's going to destroy you completely. He would have loved to know that. He would have stood in line and volunteered that. But as we watch, as we see in this passage of Scripture, the, the, the message he didn't want to carry to them was a message of forgiveness and God's love. And maybe we, it could be that we have never grown in our culture or as a person to hate anyone that intensely. Following Jesus often means, as we learn here from the book of Jonah, that that. He might ask us to do things and follow him in ways that we don't want to. I don't know your journey and your path. I don't know the, the ugliness of, of that journey that maybe some of you have, have felt and, and gone through in life. I don't know if there's any huge resentment in your life for anyone else, and, and, and yet I through the years of ministry, I've had people come to me and, and, and tell me about people who have, who have abused them and have treated them very poorly in life. And Jonah just said, I, I, I can't bear that message and so this time, I, I have got to go in a different direction. Now, if you have your map, if I have PowerPoint, I don't, and we're, we're working on that. We're going to see if we can do that again. But there's a map there that says, you know, in, in here is, is Joppa the port. And then up here, you have Nineveh. And down here, you have Tarshish. So we know that Jonah is going the exact opposite direction of where he's supposed to go. He's going as far away as he can. And maybe in our life, there are times when we feel that God's leading us to something. Maybe it's as simple as God is saying to you or to me, you need to reach out to that person and offer forgiveness. Lord, I don't owe them forgiveness. I've already gone far enough with that. They're the ones that need to come to me. I don't need to initiate. And God says, yes, you do. I've forgiven you, the Lord says. I've given you my love. And even though you don't deserve it, I've still reached out and offered you my love and my peace and my purpose. 
How can you not reach out to them? And I know, I'm, I'm a human too. I'm just like you. I, I often look at everything in terms of a scorecard. They owe me. And God says, reach out. And you know how we, we justify that? We all do. We, we, we're so good at doing that. We, we feel that urge within us maybe that, that here's something that we need to do and how we need to act and, and, and well, I don't know if that's right. You can't trust every little urge inside of you. And we talk our way out of it and we, we, we devise some schemes as to why we can ignore that message. But you know what I'm talking about because you know that's happened in your life. Sometimes broken relationships. And Jonah on a huge scale decides no. I want you to know that God often calls us to where we don't want to go. Okay, that's a concept I want to instill in, in all of our minds that God often calls us to where we don't want to go. That, that's a natural response we've got. He knows your heart. He knows what you're willing to do, what you're unwilling to do, and he will often put you in that place that tests you and that challenges you to respond to him in ways you don't want to go. An older pastor told me early in my ministry, I was only in my 20s at the time, and he said to me one day, this is great words of wisdom. He said, if, if the church is being directed by the pastor, in other words, I tell you, this is what we're going to do, and you've got to get on board, watch out. There's going to be a battle of wills. And then he said to me, Steve, if you're being directed by the church, and the church is saying to you, this is what you're going to do, and this is how you're going to do it, there's going to be a battle of wills. Watch out. Who directs the church? Jesus. Yeah, it's Christ's church. Now, then he said to me, he looked me right in the eye, this is so good. He said, after my years of ministry, I discovered that the best moves, the best change that our church ever did was when we were being directed to a place where neither of us wanted to go. Think about it. God's Spirit often directs us to where you don't really want to go, and I don't want to go either. Because God's will is often that complex that you and I would never think it on our own. It's not my desire. It's not what I want. It's not what you want. Because if we direct the church in that direction, then we're directing it to happiness. You tell me what you want me to do, and I'll go do it, and then what happens is we're all happy. Because you're getting your needs met. Parents, what happens when we are parenting to make our kids happy. You have just brought forth the most rebellious generation you'll ever bring forth. If every time my kid said, Dad, I want this, it will make me happy. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. You've caved in to happiness. God said to Jonah, I'm not here, Jonah, to give you a message that makes you happy. I'm here to give you a message that glorifies God. Churches too. God's not here to make us a happy church. He wants us to be a joy-filled church. That's different. That's spirit-led. That's not worldly-led. He's going to bring us to a place that glorifies Him and not ourselves. Jonah doesn't quite get this yet. The call that Jonah got was so outside the boundaries of Jonah's life that he said, Lord, I can't, I can't even think of it, of doing it. 
Now, here's a good thing to remember as we go through this book of Jonah. God did not give Jonah this call thinking he's going to like it. God will never check in with you first. He doesn't come to me and say, you know, Steve, I've been thinking. Maybe we ought to do this. God, God doesn't do it. He doesn't check in with me first. I've had a lot of people tell me, I tried that church thing once. I tried that God thing once, and it didn't work for me. What are they saying? Think about that. Does God work for you? See, in, in our mature Christian mind, we have to understand that, that God doesn't work for I don't get God on my side. I need to ask myself, it, it, am I on the side of God? Now, does God please me? But do I please God? God isn't here to make you happy. God didn't go to Jonah and say, I got this idea and I'm going to break this to you really, really slow, Jonah. Will you go to Nineveh? No. No, I won't go to Nineveh. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll come back to that some other time. We'll work that through. That's not God. God says, Jonah, do you love me? Yes. Are you my prophet? Yes. Have you sworn allegiance to me? Yes. I want you to go to Nineveh. No. Are you my church? Yes. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind? Yes. Do you want to serve him? Yes. Do you want to glorify him? Yes. I want you to No. David and Goliath. David did not want to fight Goliath. Joshua did not want to take on Jericho. Gideon did not want to do battle with the Midianites. Abraham did not want to go to this land that God said, I'll show you. All through the book, Paul and Silas did not want to go to the jail in Philippi. Nobody wants to pursue all of what God asks us to do with excitement and happiness. Oh, goody, goody, goody. I get to go to jail for six months. Nobody does that. Faith is understanding that God places us where we don't want to be. And that's hard. Don't, I understand that. Some of you have lived that out and have faithfully done so, so much better than I have. You have lost loveliness in your life that you may never fully understand why that had to occur. What had, why did that happen? And you may not on this earth ever understand it. And you know what? I give you so much credit because it did not rock. It might have rocked your faith at some point. But you did not lose hope. In it all. God will navigate us to where we don't want to go. Faithfulness says, I will go anywhere and be faithful to you, O Lord. I want to look at a passage of scripture, if I can. Uh, a few passages here. Jumping ahead. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now get this. Do you guys know this one? The, this past scripture, Proverbs 35, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then it says what? Oh good. Lean not on your own understanding. It took me some time to figure that out. And I have a, I have a poster at home with that on there. Because I need to look at that every day. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In other words, what it could say, if we're going to paraphrase it, trust in the Lord completely 
And don't let it rock your boat when you don't get it. Because you're not even going to trust your own understanding. In other words, when everything, the foundation of my world starts to rock and crumble, I will still trust in the Lord completely, knowing that He knows better than I do. This is, this is really key to our generation today. God knows more about your happiness and your joy than you do. So I'm leaning not on my own understanding. If everything in my psyche, my being says, no, this is wrong, this is not good, this is not going to come out good, and I don't like this at all, I will still trust in God and his word and his principles above my own understanding. Oh, that's a powerful passage. In all my ways that acknowledge him, and then what does he do? You guys get the rest of it? And he will make your paths straight. Yes. And different versions have different ways. Now, here's my understanding of that. I just kind of share this with you. When I was a youth person, I was in a youth group, and my youth directors from my home church are just down now in Appleton, Appleton Iowa. So you get to see them. Huh? Appleton, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Not Appleton. <laughs> no, Appleton, not Appleton. You, you got me. <laughs> she, she's an Appleton. <laughs> it, was, right. it was you that's uh, So, anyway, we're studying, uh, we're, we're together, we get together, you know, every few weeks. And I understood this passage of scripture to mean this. And he will make your paths straight. Meaning, it's going to work out for me. Good. I didn't understand what that interpretation meant until later on. That it's not talking about make my life good. Meaning, I look back and say, wow, it worked out for me. It means make your past straight means living through holiness and obedience in God. It has nothing to do with the easy life. It has nothing to do with working out for you or me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the story of the fiery furnace. You read that story this week, you're going to find this that they said, King, we will not bow before you or your God. And you can put us in the fiery furnace. And our God will rescue us and you're going to look stupid. Not exactly. And our God is capable of saving us. And even if he doesn't, get that passage in there. Even if he chooses that the fiery furnace is the end of our life and we're toast, God is still God. That's what you're saying. Jonah, you go to Nineveh. And they may not even receive your message. And the people you hate the most and don't want to preach to may end up, they just may kill you. But you still be faithful to me to the very end. Because I'm still God. And you're my servant. Wow. I didn't promise that. Regarding this life and the good life. He didn't promise us eternity and hope and joy with him. I always had a way of taking those verses and turning them around to something good. I do all of Jonah has to learn to be faithful to God and his call even when he 
doesn't want to. You and I this morning, even when we don't want to, even when it looks like it's heading to our own demise, even when it's the last thing on the list we want to do. There's an old hymn, and we're not going to sing it because, uh, Andrea, I didn't give it to you in time, but it says just simply this. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord. To what? To the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Jesus said to his disciples, when they were saying, we're going to follow you, Lord, it's going to be fun, it's going to be a good life. And Jesus said, he that would come after me must deny himself everything you want, everything you think you need, Take up my cross and follow me. That's called Jonah. Let's pray. Lord God, that's, that's, that's tough and that's hard. And, and in the midst of a culture that, that preaches prosperity and the good life, happiness and, and the pursuit of it, and we just have a whole list of all the wants and needs that we perceive ourselves as having. And, oh, Lord God, help us to realize that we need to deny self, deny our wants, truly take up the cross and follow you. Thank you for your servant, Jonah. He's going to get it right. It's just going to take him a kind of a roundabout way. And Lord, maybe some of us in this room are kind of heading in a roundabout way. But may we wholeheartedly surrender to you this morning. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.